what we do. <laughs> because we do actually learn things in this class. I hope you learned something in this class. By the way, I did find it very interesting that most of you for your writing assignment, you picked process the processing sarcasm paper about how the brain processes sarcasm. I appreciate that. And I think I've learned something new about you. <laughs> what was that? No, I know it's okay. But I do plan to have those graded this afternoon. So by five o'clock, if you, and, and again, I will be doing any last minute grading this weekend and on Monday. So if you turn in your paper late, like at 1155 ish, I may not get to it tonight because I'm working late night breakfast tonight and I do not have time to grade because I'm going to be flipping your pancakes and stuff like that. <laughs> It's a community service that I do. Um, <laughs> um, I think it'll be fun, but it means I won't have time to grade. Okay, so the last time that we were here, we were talking about the fact that we have this idea, and I kind of want to go back to this. So when we're talking about reading words, we kind of have this idea that we start with the letters because those are kind of our, if, if, if we're talking about language, you can kind of think of letters as being kind of our atoms. They are our atomic units. They kind of are the smallest piece that we can break down. And then everything kind of builds itself up from there. So our, we start with our letters. We have this idea that we need to identify the letters first to be able to identify the words. And we always work up from the letter of level to word. So if we want to be able to identify a word, we first need to identify its component letters. The problem with this is that it doesn't actually square with the research that people have done looking at word identification. So the last time we were here, we talked about something called the word superiority effect. So I very, very briefly present you with a letter string. God bless annotate. So I either give you a, a string of words that's like this, or I give you a string of words that like is like this. How's that for a holiday themed word? Um, so I'm gonna briefly show you these words and then I'm going to mask them. So I'm going to briefly show you the word. You may not even consciously be able to report it. And then I'm gonna cover it up with these symbols to basically erase what you saw. So then after I mask those letters, I ask you to determine whether this letter was present in the first position or a different letter was. And it turns out that letter identification is better if that string formed a word. So we always think that we need to be able to identify the letters to identify the word, but sometimes identifying the word helps us identify its component letters. So this, you can see there's, that's why there's that big pink X, because we have this idea that this is the way that word identification works and it doesn't. And here's what's especially interesting. Not only does this occur for words, this occurs for random strings of letters that could look like words, but aren't. So not only do we have a word superiority effect where having a word helps you identify the letters more quickly, uh, we also have a pseudo word superiority effect. So having something that looks like it forms a word helps us identify letters more quickly. So kind of based on this, people have developed this interactive activation model of how we do um, identification. And this is cognitive psychology. We talk about a lot of theoretical constructs here. We have a lot of models made up of boxes. They have seen so many models that look like boxes. Um, so the idea here is we have a word that's written. We're trying to read it. So words are made up of certain features. So if I have, and I'm going to try to draw this and hopefully it's not terrible. So if I have a horizontal line here, that there are only so many letters that have a horizontal line. So if I see the features, I am going to send activation to any letter that has those features. I'm going to send inhibition to any letter that doesn't have those features. So for example, I'll send X, this is a horizontal line. It's not very well drawn, 
but I'm going to send activation to something like the letter E, which is made up of three horizontal lines. I am going to send inhibition to the letter C because the C is just a curve. So then from the letter level, once we have those activations, any, any word that contains that letter will get activation. So that's one way that this can work. So we can start with the features, we work our way up to letters, and we work our way up to words. However, we also can start at the word level. And so if I activate a word, information will be activated at the letter and the feature level. So this can work in a top, uh, top down process from the letter of words, thus explaining the word superiority effect. And it can also work from the, uh, I'm going to hide this. This is bugging me. It doesn't let me go all the way down. So it's just going to, oh, well, now you went down. Okay. Um, so this explains the word superiority effect. Hey, Natasha. Um, and then it also explains how we can do letter all the way up to word identification. So this is not a unidirectional process. This is a bi-directional process. Letters can help us identify words. Words can help us identify letters and they interact with each other. Kind of cool, huh? Okay, so I wanna talk, we've already kind of talked, going back a little bit, we've already kind of talked about what are known as phonological neighbors. So words that kind of sound like each other. So gate sounds like bait and get and mate they have some sounds that are in common. Now, when we're talking about reading, we also have to talk a little bit about what are called orthographic neighbor, neighbors. So whereas phonological neighbors are based on words that sound similar, orthographic neighbors are all about words that look similar. So if I have the word stem, I have words like seam, step, and stew. None of them sound like each other, but they have similar letters in common. So here's what's kind of interesting. Identification speed. So being able to identify a word actually depends on how many orthographic neighbors that you have. So they will also become activated. So if I activate the word stem, I am also going to activate seam, stew, step, stairs, et cetera, because they have some similar features in common. Now, generally, the more orthographic neighbors that you have, the more your identification rate is going to slow down. And what's especially interesting is that this slowdown becomes very obvious if these orthographic neighbors are words that we use a lot. So high frequency words. So words like, what's a word we say a lot? I'm going to have to look at a record of high frequency words. It's going to bug me if I can't think of them. <laughs> Okay, high frequency words. Here we go. Okay. Um, one of the highest frequency words, dog. There we go. So if I have a word like dig, and I also have a word like dog as an orthographic neighbor, that's going to actually slow down my identification rate because dog is more common than dig. And because of that, I'm going to get a lot of interference. Items compete for each other when we're reading, when we're speaking, when we're listening. So part of the reason that this slowdown happens is that generally the more common and the more frequent a word is, the higher its resting activation rate. It's already going to be more active because it's more frequent. However, one thing that I will mention, like many things that sound really fascinating, it's really hard to get this effect. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Floppy is a high frequency word? That doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Anybody needs some more time here? Okay. So I want to think a little bit about this interactive activation model. So I think it does a really good job of explaining how the word superiority effect happens. It does a really good job about 
how letters influence word recognition and word recognition assists with letter identification. So we have this nice bi-directional relationship here. But here's the thing about reading. Everything okay? Oh, yeah, I was looking at Kay putting up a... Oh, okay, I was like, is somebody... I'm like, if y'all um, want to come in and watch the class, you know, like... Waiting for Kay to look at me so I can make a face at them, because we do that to each other. I, I see. And it's okay. Stuff happens. No, I saw somebody outside. I'm like, hmm, okay. So here's the thing about this model, though. And we've already kind of talked about this a little bit based on Wednesday. Sometimes when we read, we do access what a word sounds like. There's no discussion of phonology here. Additionally, we don't have anything about word meaning. And we know that we access the meaning of a word well before we access what it sounds like and possibly even what it looks like. None of those things are here and reading is very complicated. This, while very helpful, is somewhat of an oversimplification of what we actually do. Okay, I had my water, so now I'm not having two of these in a row. Good job. Okay, so I wanna share with you one of my favorite studies that we talk about in this class. And I wanna talk about the role that meaning actually plays in word identification. And I'm going to preface this by telling you, this is one of my favorite uh, cognitive psych studies. And I had the opportunity to actually meet Neely at the annual conference in my field. And I absolutely fangirled over meeting Neely and being like, I love your 1977 study. <laughs> but I'll explain why I love it so much in a moment. So one of the things that we know with meaning is that we have a phenomenon known as what is called semantic priming. So basically, if I give you a word like nurse, a word like doctor is more likely to be activated. It's more likely to pop into your head because they have a very similar meaning. They're very strongly associated with each other. Um, and because of that, one of them will prime the other. Now, compare that to something like Library Doctor, and unless you are watching that one episode of Doctor Who where they go to the library and Donna Noble gets saved and, and pops up in the library, unless you are watching that episode, Library doesn't really have as strong of a connection with Doctor, so Library will not typically prime Doctor the way that Nurse primes Doctor. So if I give you the word Library, Doctor is not going to be the first thing that pops into your mind. It's going to be something like a book. So Neely actually looked at semantic priming, and here's what's Here's what he did that was interesting. He looked at the role that automatic processing plays versus more slow controlled processing. So he would either give people a category name that was followed by a member of a different category, but they were taught to expect it. So if they got the word bird, they were expecting to get a part of a house, like a window or a door. Every now and then, um, the category name would be followed by a member of that category, so a very strong associated prime, but it was unexpected. So they would get bird, and then they would get the word magpie. So a magpie is a type of bird. If you don't know, they like really shiny things. So I guess I'm a magpie. Um, I like shiny things. Um, but the idea here is that you are trained on this, even though it's not a good fit. This is going to be more of a controlled process. On the other hand, you are not trained on category members, but they're very strongly associated with each other. And because of that, that's going to involve more automatic processing. So what Neely did was he varied the time between when they got the prime and when they got the follow-up word to see when automatic would stop working and controlled processing would take over. This data is so cool. Are you ready to see it? I will explain it to you because I will look at it right away and just go, oh, 
and you'll just be like, what? <laughs> so I'm going to help orient you through this data because it's really cool. So what you are looking at here is the time between the prime being presented and then the target. So this is 250 milliseconds. So they would get the prime and then 250 milliseconds later. So basically one fourth of a second, they'd get the prime. Here, they would get the prime immediately, and then 400 milliseconds later, they'd get the target. And then in this case, they would get the prime, and 700 milliseconds later, they would get the target. A millisecond is basically one thousandth of a second. So 1,000 milliseconds is one second. So this is like almost a whole second, but not quite. Now, what you're looking at here is how much they sped up or slowed down. So anything that is above this line of zero is facilitation. They got faster. Anything that is below zero is inhibition. They got slower. So I first want to start by talking about the expected. So here's what you notice. If it's expected and it's semantically related. So if you were trained to remember this, you are always facilitating. That makes sense, right? Like if it's expected and it's also very strongly associated, that seems like it fits with facilitation. Now let's look at the other one down here. If it's unexpected and it's semantically unrelated, you can see it's always going to be inhibition here. So you don't expect it, you weren't trained on it, and they don't fit well together. This is always going to produce inhibition. But I want to focus on these two categories. So expected and semantically unrelated and ex are an unexpected and semantically related. And that's where the data gets really cool. So if we have expected and semantically unrelated, here's what I want you to notice. Initially, there is very little facilitation, particularly when the time between the prime and target is short. But look at what happens at around 700 milliseconds in. So initially, even though you were trained on this, because they're not related, there's not really a lot of help in terms of processing until you have enough time to think about it. And with training and with a longer retention interval, you're like, oh yeah. And that's when your training takes it, takes over. So this is when we're largely operating on automatic processing. And here's where we're doing more controlled processing. Now, let's talk about the unexpected one, the one that we weren't trained on, but we later, but they're, we didn't expect it. So we weren't trained on it, but they're very strongly related. Initially, we start with facilitation. That is automatic processing. But as the prime to target interval increases, look what happens. And this is cool. We get a complete crossover between these two categories. So we start out automatic, but as the time increases, we shift toward that more controlled processing. And because we didn't expect it, we get inhibition. So this is when our controlled processing truly takes over. So you can kind of see the interplay between automatic and then the more controlled processing. Does that kind of make sense? I think it's really cool. <laughs> okay. So in addition to, and, and so what this really tells us is that meaning really can be an automatic process for us. Now, if something doesn't fit well together, we're going to need more controlled processes to make it meaningful. But now let's talk about the role that context plays. So generally, what we find is that we do take context into account. Um, generally, what we're going to find is we actually get more semantic priming when it fits with the context. So for, and what's especially interesting are the times that context does not matter. So what's interesting, so let's talk about a homophone like flour, the flour that grows versus the flour that we bake with. Now, this is typically non-dominant. When we think of flour, 
we think of the ones that grow. We don't typically think about the ones that we bake with as much unless we do a lot of baking in our lives. So what's interesting is that when people have done eye tracker studies and they're looking at reading, we tend to fixate more on the dominant meanings of homophones, despite the fact that the context is about the other homophone, the non-dominant meaning. So if I have the word flower, like the kind you grow, in a paragraph, about baking, we're actually going to fixate on that more despite the fact that it's not currently fitting with the current context. So homophones seem to be pretty special in that regard. Everybody good? Okay. So now we're going to talk about reading out loud. I know you read out loud all the time. <laughs> do you? Oh, actually, you're in education. You do. <laughs> okay. So I need somebody brave to read some of these words for me. Okay. Can you read all? Can somebody read all of these words for me? Somebody want to give it a shot? Hannah, go for it. Okay, so those last two are not real words. I actually mark them as pseudo words, but I wanna kind of point out that this is something we do really easily, despite the fact that the English language can be kind of messy in that regard. So for example, we have comb, the B is silent. <laughs> we have pint, which is technically an irregular pronunciation. We don't usually pronounce it with the long I. We have things like hint, do we have another word that has INT that goes int? I'm trying to think. I'm going to look it up because it's going to bug me. Tint. Huh? Tint. Tint. Thank you. That's no, it's oh, T-I-N-T. Oh, like, yeah, no, tint. tint. Yeah. No, that's a tent, not a tint. <laughs> Remember we talked about the I pin, pen, and pe pin versus pen distinction? Those are a little more similar for you. So it's a dialect thing. So we have pint, which is technically an irregular pronunciation. And then we have words like mantiness and fast, which are not actual words at all. That makes it really, really hard. And yet somehow, Hannah, you just did that like it was no problem at all. Again, remember what I told you at the very beginning of this class, it's all about finding wonder in the ordinary. This is something we do all the time. And yet look at all of the different obstacles that we have. So I'll tell you a really quick story while we're waiting. Um, I learned to read at a really early age. I learned how to read at about three. By about five, I was reading like the Ramona Quimby books on my own without a lot of help. Um, and so I read pretty straight. I read pretty easily. So my mom was, we had just moved to a new town. I was in kindergarten. Mom was driving around downtown trying to find um, the driver's license bureau at the time. And we kept running into the parking lot of this antique shop. And I point blank said to my mom, I don't know why we keep driving around to the anti-Q shop. Because nobody had taught me that antique. it's antique, that it's kind of not standard English pronunciation. Yes, it is. It's cute when you're five. As an adult, it's kind of weird. <laughs> okay. Hi, scary model. <laughs> it's really not that bad when you think about it. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Your book refers to this as the DRC model, but this is technically called the dual root cascaded model. Um, so the thing is, I want to go back to this really quick. So we have words and then we have these non-words. And the DRC model basically says that when we read a word versus a non-word, we are actually doing different types of processes. Now, some of these are rule-based. So some of these are based on rules that we have learned through our exposure to the world, and some of them are not. So this was originally developed by Colt Hart and colleagues. So we're gonna talk about three different routes. Um, I think your book actually tries to keep it a bit simpler. 
Like I'm going to go into a bit more detail than your book does. Oh, your book also talks about the phonics approach. <laughs> um, yeah, when I was in school, that was definitely around the time that phonics teaching was a big deal. So when I was in first grade, when we were doing the reading class, we definitely had some phonics works book, workbooks at the time. Okay. So remember that this is originally meant for reading out loud. So what we're basically going to be doing is we're going to be converting from print to speech here. Okay. All right. Natasha, do you need any more time or are you working ahead? I'm actually, I think, one slide ahead. Nice. Excellent. Okay. Here it is. So before we actually go into the model itself, I want to give you a couple of different assumptions that this model has. And again, your book's not going to go into this as much as I do. Um, so first of all, this is what we call a weak phonological model, which again, assumes that knowing what a word sounds like is not critical to identifying or reading the word. So you can use what a word sounds like to help you read, but you don't have to. So we're going to talk about three different roots. So we have root one, which is what we call a non-lexical root. We'll talk about why we call it a non-lexical root. And then we have root two and root three. Both of these are what are known as lexical roots. Or, so additionally, oftentimes what we're going to find is that when we are reading words based on print, Oftentimes, when we're naming words, that is largely going to be based on a lexical root. And here's why we call it the dual root cascaded model. So this is not a serial model. So you don't go through one step at a time. As you are finishing up one of the steps, some of that activation is cascading forward to the next level. So it's not quite parallel because they're not necessarily being done simultaneously, but it's not purely serial either. Is this model something that we need to learn? Um, I think for the final, I don't think we talk about a lot of the details of the model, but there might be some questions about different types of dyslexia based on this model. But I would say when in doubt, check your study guide. If it's, this is more for your enrichment and, and I am not one of those people that necessarily teaches to a test. I want you to know everything in as much time as I can give it to you. But generally the rule is if it's not in the study guide, you don't really have to worry about it. So this can be for enrichment purposes. <laughs> okay. So the very first root is basically an indirect root. It is also non-lexical. So this is what we call grapheme. So we're focusing on what the word sounds like or what the word, how the word is spelled into phonemes. So it's basically converting spelling into sound. So it turns out that root one is really important for reading irregular words like pint. So evidence from this actually comes from what is referred to as surface dyslexia. So researchers um, have patient KT. Patient KT is really good at reading non-words. Patient KT is really good at reading regular words, but seems to have a big problem with irregular words and basically is making what we call regular regularization errors. So instead of calling it pint, they're going to call it pint. So this is a case where they're not able to convert that spelling into sound. So damage to root one leads to uh, surface dyslexia. Now we're going to talk about um, people. So there is a type of dementia out there called semantic dementia. 
These are people that have difficulty with understanding the meanings of words in language. And what we do tend to find is that patients with semantic dementia also do display surface dyslexia. So surface dyslexia is when you have difficulty with irregular words. So this one is rule-based in nature. This is based on previous exposure that you've had. So it's explicitly being like, okay, P-I-N-T makes the sound pint. So you have that rule in root one so that you can convert it very easily. <clears throat> All right, anybody have any questions? Okay. We've only got like 13 minutes left. You're almost done. You're almost done. You're almost done. <laughs> Not that I don't think you've enjoyed your time with me. I think you have, but I think you're also ready to be done with classes and ready for a break. Me too. <laughs> okay. So root two and root three are going to be different. So the reason that we call root two and root three lexical roots rather than root one, which is a non-lexical root, so it turns out that we all have what we call a lexicon. A lexicon is basically your own mind's internal dictionary. So you have what is called an orthographic input lexicon. So when you read a word, it activates the meaning and the other information related to that word. So when you go to a dictionary, you have what the word looks like, you have what the word sounds like, so you usually have a pronunciation guide, and you have an understanding of meaning. So researchers have suggested that you and I have our own internal dictionary, and this is called the lexicon. So this is specific to familiar words. So root two, we're taking into account the lexicon and the semantic system. So you see the word, you go to the lexicon, you activate the meaning, and then you get the pronunciation based on the meaning. So this is critical for familiar words. If you have, if you cannot, op if you operate on root two alone, so if you have damage to your other systems and the only system that you can rely on is root two, you could potentially develop what is called phonological dyslexia because the lexicon is only going to work very well for familiar words. If you have phonological dyslexia, you're going to have difficulty with unfamiliar words and non-words. Why? Because they're not in the lexicon. Unfamiliar words, if you've never encountered them before, they're not going to be in your lexicon. So if you've never heard, we talked about this in Jen's psych today, so I thought I would share with you. If you've never heard the word sesquipedalian, it means really long words. No, we were talking about somebody actually brought up that there's a fear of long words and it's sesquipedalophobia. And it kills your kids yeah, well, which is the point, which is the point. But if you don't know what sesquipedalian means, it's not going to be in your lexicon. You're not going to have that information. And so if you only rely on root two, you're going to get that phonological dyslexia. These people have problems reading unfamiliar words. They have non-words. They also experience some difficulty with that grapheme phoneme conversion. So they don't have, they're only relying on root two. They don't have root one to help them out. So you get cases like patient RG who could only read about 10% of non-words that were presented. So we've talked about surface dyslexia. We've talked about phonological dyslexia. And we're going to talk about one more. Anybody need some more time? Everybody good? OK. So root three is basically the same. You're just going to only use the lexicon. So you're going to bypass the semantic system. You're only going to focus on what the pronunciation is supposed to be and move on from there. 
So I want to talk about another type of dyslexia that's called deep dyslexia. So people with deep dyslexia, they look a lot like people with phonological dyslexia. They have difficulty reading unfamiliar words and non-words. However, these are people that are solely relying on root three because root three doesn't use the semantic system. So what will happen if you're only relying on root three, so you have damage to root one, you have damage to root two, you're only going to be able to read familiar words and you're not accessing meaning. So you're gonna make semantic reading errors. So if you give somebody with deep dyslexia the word ship, they're gonna read it as boat even though they are technically not quite the same thing. A ship is a type of a boat. <laughs> now, researchers have found that deep dyslexia often um, results due to left hemisphere brain damage. That makes sense, right? For most of us, the left hemisphere is primarily gonna be where that language processing occurs. Remember that if you're left-handed, it's a little bit more complicated because there's less lateralization. Um, but when we damage those left hemisphere language areas, that means you're not gonna be able to do the grapheme phoneme conversion of root one, you don't have the semantic system of root two, which means you are solely relying on root three which basically means you have a more severe form of phonological dyslexia, hence why we call it deep dyslexia. Everybody good? Maybe? Yes? No? Okay, I was like, sometimes they need a thumbs up. You're not smiling, I don't know. <laughs> Facial expressions are not always my thing. Okay, so let's think a little bit about the dual root cascaded model. So a lot of this model was actually based on how long it takes people to pronounce and read words out loud. Remember, this is about converting print into sound and pronunciation. So the question is, is the pronounce there's a confound in pronunciation time is it based on the regularity of the word or how consistently it's used we we can't always notice the difference um additionally one of the major problems with this model is it denies the fact that phonological processing is really fast the dual root cascaded model implies that it's slow so we start here we go to this, and then we get to our phonological output. That doesn't really fit with what we know about phonological processing of words. They happen pretty fast. This model makes it one of the last steps of the chain. That doesn't fit with what we know. Additionally, we talk about a semantic model here in root two, but we don't actually talk about what it does. So it's not very well implemented here. Everybody good? Okay. All right. I'm going to skip this because it's kind of scary. Your book talks a little bit more about the triangle model, but I'm not really going to be testing you on it. So I'm going to skip it. And I want to talk a little bit about eye tracking in the last five minutes because I talked about how cool eye tracking was. And yet I'm not really going to have too much opportunity to hear, but I wanted to share this with you in the last five minutes. So um, I want to do something really quickly. Um, hmm, does somebody have a book? Okay, I want us all to get up for a second and Hannah, not to put pressure on you or anything, but I want you to read your book. And while you're reading your book, we're gonna be looking at what your eyes are doing, but you just focus on reading the book, okay? So if you wanna get up, we're gonna take a little field trip to watch the inner room. I don't read my head. Huh? I was reading my head. Yeah, don't read out loud. This is not a dual root cascaded model. And I would say pull your book up so that we can actually see what your eyes are doing. So feel free to bend down, take a peek, pretend like we're not mm -hmm. watching. Not an audience. 
Yeah, if you got to bend down a little bit to see her eyes move, that's fine. Okay. I feel like that's enough time. So Hannah, here's my question to you. You can go ahead and I'll sit down. Thank you very much for a field trip. It's always nice to stretch your legs. Um, so Hannah, when you were reading that, how did you have the sensation of how your eyes were moving at that point? Smooth? You're going left to right, left to right, left to right. It was smooth going left to right, but then like when I cut back to the next line. Then, then you're jumping down. down. Okay, so is that what you experienced her eyes doing? So here's what's really interesting. We have the sensation that when we read something, our eyes are moving very smoothly from left to right. That is not what we see when we actually watch other people read. So you can try this with your classmates or with like your sweet mates later. What you're gonna notice is that their eyes are gonna make these little jerks. They're not gonna move smoothly like this. They're gonna make these little jerky jumps. Those are known as saccades and we're gonna talk about them in just a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about saccades. So, your eyes do not move smoothly. They move in these little rapid ballistic jerks. And so here's what's critical about them. So they're very rapid. We call them ballistic because much like a ballistic missile, once you initiate the movement, you can't change it. So once that eye movement starts, it has to go all the way to the end before you can change it back. When we have people actually read and eye trackers are watching them, each saccade takes about 20 to 30 milliseconds. And that roughly corresponds to about eight letters or spaces of text. And here's what's critical. So you'll notice those little jerking movements. And then we get these longer pauses that are known as fixations. And those tend to last about one fifth to one fourth of a second. And this is where most of our information comes from. So guess what? You aren't actually reading everything you're reading. You skip words when you read. Words like the, a, uh, and, or, you skip them. So yeah, go get video of you reading something. And I promise you, your eyes do not smoothly move at all. So one of the ways that we can actually do this is with something that's called perceptual span. So while you're reading, the computer program is keeping track of where your eyes are. And basically it's going to block out anything that's on that window. So this is what is called our effective field of view. English is a left to right language. So what we find is that there is some asymmetry. We have more on the right side of space because that's where the future words are going to be than we do on the left side. Now, if we're talking about a right to left language like Arabic or Hebrew, Hebrew, that's going to be reversed. There's going to be more to the left than to the right. Um, but generally, it's going to extend three to four letters to the left, up to 15 on the right. And we're constantly going to be shifting that fixation with every saccade. So unfortunately, I do not have more time for you. Uh, if you're planning on taking the final, I will send you links to previous videos that I've recorded to help you. And on Sunday, I will be sending you a recorded study guide session so that you can watch it on your own time. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know that there are not many.